So it's finally decided to rear its ugly head. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, The Trogly's Guitar Show. Meme culture, something I truly appreciate, and it's evolved throughout the years, but in the early days of guitar internet history, there were always some very interesting guitar modification photos floating around out there. People love being shocked at the horror of how vintage guitars used to be repaired, like whatever this monstrosity is. Just zip tie your headstock, it'll be fine. Yeah, dude, I totally just bought a new Fender. Ready to play fast like Yngwie? DIY scalloped fretboard. But in my opinion, there were four top dog meme Les Pauls that existed. One of them was a Photoshop mock-up job. It was called Lawsuit Proof. However, thankfully, they make them over in China, so we were able to kind of document one. But the top three, in my opinion, were the Headless SG, which thanks to the help of my YouTube channel, I was able to find and document for the world. We finally got to see what it looked like on the back. Follow that up by the Boat Paddle Weight Relief Deluxe. I'm still looking for this one because it's just so doofy. And then we had this weird thing. 100 million different knobs, four different pickups, two selector switches. It's too bizarre. Once you see it, you don't forget it. I've been searching and the search is over. That's right, my friends. September 18th, 2023 is when this one became public again. Listed by Irwin's Gear Emporium over in New York, and it's $7,500. And it's described as a 1978 Gibson Les Paul Custom electric guitar, one of a kind with a glass display case. Let's dive in here. First off, it's a righty guitar. The old photos that used to circulate about this one kind of made it look like a lefty. If you look at your neck pickup, it has the Gibson embossing right there, so that's why I thought, okay, that's not a flipped photo after all. If you zoom in, you can kind of see it looks like somebody might have photoshopped that to make it look correct. Because here's our real guitar in righty format. So let's break this thing down. We've got a 1972-ish Gibson T-top humbucker, which is technically supposed to be for the bridge position, because in that year only, plus or minus a couple of months here and there, Gibson used these embossed pickup covers. So that's pretty cool. That pickup is worth like 500-ish on its own. Then normally we only have a bridge position pickup after that, but instead of our regular humbucker, it's a dog ear P90. That's right, not a soap bar. They decided to go full on junior, but instead of routing it for a third humbucker or other pickup, they decided to slam a mini humbucker in here and then some sort of a single coil. So it's like Les Paul Jr., a little bit of deluxe. You've got some Stratocaster in here, regular full on Les Paul. I mean, that's a whole lot of tones. And then you come over here, there's two different sides selector switches. I mean, how is that even going to work? You come down here, how many is 100 million knobs? Well, it's actually only two complete sets. And yes, we have multiple photo angles this time, so we know it's actually been modified. But once I saw this photo, everything suddenly made complete sense. There's two output jacks on the side. This is very similar to a Telecaster that we had documented not too long ago. This was likely created during the whole payola schemes, where session musicians would get these special guitars modified, so they only have to play the take once, but yet they're going to get paid for playing it twice, because they're recording out of both of the output jacks and they can select these different <laughs> pickups. So it's great, you can get four different takes with only two takes. And they've got all the pickups slammed in there, so the whole thing starts to make sense. If I had to guess, it's probably neck and bridge and then the two different middle pickups. And that's what each of these select. So this is likely your volume controls for the first set, the tone controls, and so on and so forth over there. And honestly, that kind of makes the guitar cooler to me because I just always thought of some crazy guy out here, but no, it was purpose built and driven. But up until today, my friends, we have not seen the back of this. And here's what it looks like. We've got these giant white back plates. I mean, I suppose it could be a lot worse than this, right? It definitely seen some use. It's all scratched up back here, straight through the finish. But if we remove those plates, now we can see the beast. This looks more like somebody needed to do a job and be innovative, so they hacked away at it with what they had. They really just had to extend the cavity a little bit right here, and then a little bit down there, and then they were able to fit all the pots in here. So again, it could have been a lot worse than it was, and they just decided to slap a big plate over it. All right, how is our toggle switch cavity? Ah, uh, yeah, this one's not quite as pretty. <laughs> like this poor guitar, all it really needed was another one of these split semicircle and turn this one around. I mean, that one could have been done cleaner, but they did the best with what they had. Apparently some sort of a mouse. 
But hey, okay, they fit it all in there, and then they probably had to enlarge our output jack area too. What I don't understand is why, why don't we have these? I don't know on that one. Maybe you guys can help. Because I always thought it was like a plate that they just kind of pre-installed and they didn't have washers and whatnot, so they just wanted to screw it in there. But check this out. We've got two, count it, two screws over here acting as like a pick guard. You could still put a pick guard on this and I think it would look kind of cool. Maybe somebody did play this as a lefty at one point in time, or maybe this guy was all about symmetry in a strange roundabout way. <laughs> Or perhaps if they're a recording artist, they like to screw something to the top, like a set list or something. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up at this point. So now that we understand the history and have seen the modifications, I was always curious what year would this Les Paul custom be? Because remember, we can only go off of this photo. And judging by the fact that we had the embossed cover, I thought it was probably like a 1972-ish Les Paul custom. I mean, it's got the ABR1 bridge. It's got the characteristic sunburst finish. Now, granted, it does have the 90s style case, but those things can easily be replaced. And it's currently being listed as a 78. So we can take a look at our headstock style, take special mention of our Gibson logo. This definitely tells us we are within the 70s. We come down here, we've got a bone nut. So that tells us it's likely pre-1975, unless it's a Kalamazoo built one because they kept using the bone nuts a little bit longer. But our truss rod cover actually tells us a lot. So this is definitely pre-1975. Flip it over to the backside, we've got the Cluson waffle backs. Again, that tells us likely pre-1975. We've got a volute, so that tells us this has to be after 1969. And judging by how large it is, this is easily 1970 through 1975 so far. But now we can see our beautiful serial number. Now does this tell us everything we need to know? Unfortunately, not in this era. Looks like it's 7353, maybe 86. So I'm thinking that's how they came up with 1978 is they took the typical year, day, 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 year production number, even though we're missing two digits for that. And I mean nothing against the shop, but if you look through their inventory, it doesn't look like Gibson is what they specialize in. That said, they do still have a couple of Les Pauls, so they do seem to know what they're talking about in that case. But another thing you can look for to tell you where this thing was created is what style of bridge you have. Since it has the true ABR1, again, that tells us it's before they introduced the Nashville style bridge when they opened the Nashville plant, which if I remember correctly, that's 1974. But they don't start using all the stuff on everything until like that transitional period of 75 to 76. And not everything was made at the new Nashville plant. A lot of things stayed in Kalamazoo. And this shot right here tells us a lot too. We've got the pancake body construction. So again, that tells us 1969 through about 1976-ish. Now we're just talking about the middle pancake layer. There's actually another pancake layer right underneath the maple top and this other section of mahogany that you don't see unless the guitar you have has thin binding in the cutaway. Then you can see it. That continues on throughout the 70s. Another thing that we can use to help us date this guitar is look at your neck. It's made of mahogany. Generally speaking, within Gibson's territory, you're going to find one piece maple, three piece maple, five piece maple with the walnut stripes and or ebony sometimes, and then you'll find the three piece mahogany and one piece mahogany. So when you have those five options, yeah, three piece mahogany works for this one. You can see our seam lines right here, and then you have your headstock wings over here. So again, 75, 76, that's when they start to transition into maple. Doesn't mean you won't find some 74s with maples. I mean, look at this crazy 20th anniversary I have in my personal collection. That one's more so in early 75. And then again, we've got this humbucker. Maybe it was original. I suppose while we're at it, the fret style on the early 70s Kalamazoo ones are like very small, which is what you're seeing here. So everything for this one is pointing early 70s, 1970 through 1975. The best way to date a guitar in this era is your pot codes. Assuming these are original, at least four of them had to have been added. However, this still looks like the original set of capacitors right here and right there. So if we could get the dates off of these pots right here, we might be able to finally say, hey, that is a blah, 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 blah. If I had to pinpoint it, I would honestly just say it's probably a 72 slash 73. 
Now, in the grand scheme of things, does it really matter? Honestly, calling it a 78 is hurting them a little bit because that would be within the Maple Neck era. Those customs sell for just a little bit less. Now I need to fill you guys in on a little bit of a backstory. This reverb listing was not the first time I saw it. It was actually on September 8th. Adam posted some teaser shots. Les Paul converted into more Paul. This is an actual 78 custom he just bought, he said. And I saw it and I was like, oh, it has finally, finally come. So naturally, I'm messaging this guy trying to make it happen so I could headless SG this thing. And for me, I wanted to hush this up so I could be the guy that brings it out and then like interview him how we found it and all that. Like I wasn't trying to steal the thunder from him because it doesn't seem like he knew that this thing was kind of like a living legend within guitar meme culture. I was just hoping to bring this one to the light of the public and have a nice video, show you the back, tear it all apart together. Unfortunately, we were about a thousand bucks apart, but that's okay. I get to make this video and say about all the same things. We just don't get to hear it, unfortunately. It would still be fun to buy this, to have in display in my museum, but I lost the headless SG and it's in a loving home, so I don't see it coming back. So if I can't have the complete meme set in person, at least I could have videos talking about them. But now to round out tonight's episode, is this a fair price? A 71 through 75-ish Les Paul Custom will probably run you between four and $8,000. It really just depends on the condition. Yeah, you got crazies asking 9,000 plus, but it takes a very special example to break that $8,000 barrier. So on paper, is this worth this price? No, not at all. However, it only takes one guy like me who loves the meme culture and history behind this one to go, okay, that one is worth paying a premium for because let's face it it's a famous guitar but the other thing that plays into the value of this one is you need to figure out what exactly are these pickups so we already know this one's a 72 ish humbucker depending on what's going on here it's probably worth about 500 but is this a 60s epiphone mini humbucker is it a 70s gibson variation best case scenario it's worth about 300 bucks but where i would get really excited is is this a real vintage stratocaster pickup or is it just some cheap nasty thing go down here is this a real p90 bridge pickup from a les paul jr or some sort of an arch top guitar if it is i mean that might be worth you know 500 to a thousand bucks so you could take that into consideration of it's a hacked up weirdly modified les paul but you could always take this fill those that routes in refinish it and or just make it an ace fraley custom because three humbucker routes should hide mostly everything except for like some additional screws from our dog ear P90. And then that would be a desirable guitar in that aspect. But what I'm saying is those values kind of help us see what it would be worth. Because if this guitar wasn't famous, I would probably say it's worth 28 to 3500 before we know details on all the pickups. Then of course we can figure in what this display case might be worth to someone. In fact, I'm really surprised it's still on the original Clues and Waffle backs. I mean, those are worth decent money if they're still functioning properly. But besides figuring out price, why would somebody want this today? The whole payola stuff isn't exactly as common. I mean, you've got reamping for that nowadays. Well, my friends, do you remember this cool Les Paul Custom that we have reviewed and documented? That was also birthed in the early 70s. It was a Les Paul Custom Stereo. At its core, it was a stereo model. You were meant to run it in a stereo amp or within two amps. And that was a great experience with my Marshall Blues Breaker and Deluxe Reverb reissue. This one, technically you could also just call it a stereo guitar. However, the way it's set up, it most likely payola. <laughs> but that is all I have to say about this one. It's cool, it's beautiful. Wish I could have documented it, but I'm glad we were able to see the photos. And maybe one day we will hear a session musician really give this a run for its money. All right, Droglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.